So if I was in Australia, I'd be saying, G'day, mate. Have you heard that before? All right. I've been trying to teach uh, Todd and Joanna some of our slangs, which I was very unfamiliar with 12 years ago. But uh, I'm slowly getting used to that. So I still remember when I was in my outpatients, the first patient walked in and said, Doc, I'm crook. And I quickly look at the surname, and it wasn't crook. And I said, are you trying to tell me that you're a crook? But in Australian, when, it, when someone says, Doc, I'm crook, it means, Doc, I'm sick. So you can imagine I had a lot to adjust to. So um, just to give you a bit of background, because everyone's confused about my accent. And uh, I was born in Kuwait in the Middle East. Uh, lived 16 years of my life there, born to South Indian parents from the state of Kerala. And if you've ever been there, we call it God's own country. It's beautiful. Uh, what's interesting is about the state of Kerala is that's where the gospel first came to in India. And so my grandfather was the first convert in our family. Uh, he came from a secular or a nominal Christian background called the Jacobites very similar to the Syrian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox. And then he got saved, and he was an evangelist from the age of 21 to 74. So I studied in Kuwait for um, till I was in year 10, and then moved to South India, where I studied year 11 and 12, and then did my basic undergraduate medical degree. We call it MBBS. And then from there, I did my MD in internal medicine, I worked as an assistant professor and associate professor for about 10 years, then moved to Malaysia, where I worked again for another two years. And 12 years ago, I immigrated to Australia, which I'm proudly calling my home. So that's basically a little bit of a background of where I come from. Um, I work in a country town called Kalgoorlie. I'm obviously in the wrong profession because it's a gold mining town. And trust me, those who are in gold mining, they earn a lot of money. So we have one of the largest open-cut gold mines in the Southern Hemisphere. And in one of these mines, they make about a million dollars every day. Um, and so I serve a population of about 32,000. I'm the head of Department of Medicine, but I'm fully clinical. I do patient care. I do a one in three on call. I'm a hands-on clinician, but I also do administrative work to run other consultants, registrars. We are a teaching hospital, so I teach undergraduate and postgraduate medical students. I'm also an advanced life support instructor. Funny that this should happen to me. Um, so why I've said all this is I'm not just a quack with this title raised from the dead. I might know a little bit of what I'm talking about, and I hope that I can show you that. I'd like to introduce you to my wife. She would have loved to be here. It's, uh, her name is Sherry, spelled the American way, S-H-E-R-R-Y. And this is my son, Michael. I like to show this picture because he's really short here. He's 6'2 now, so he just towers over me. And this is uh, Sherry's dad, Mr. Jacob, and he's part of the story. So um, Sherry and Michael send their greetings, and Mr. Jacob does as well. So I'm not sure how many of you have been to Australia. Can you have some hands? OK, there's a few people. Um, we live in a place called Kalgoorlie, which is right here. And I hope you can see that red arrow. It's called Kalgoorlie Boulder. So it's actually northeast of Perth, which is here. And the reason I show you this map is on the 24th of October 2008, I had actually been in a city called Esperance, which is on the coast. And if you ever come to the western side of Australia, you should visit Esperance. It's got the most beautiful beaches that you will ever see. And I'm very privileged because I'm not just a physician for the city of Kalgoorlie, Boulder, but I'm a regional physician as well. So five times a year, we travel. It's about 400 kilometers. Um, I don't know what that is in miles, but I, I assume it's about three, you know, 200 or something like that. But it was 400 kilometers, and I drive there, stay overnight, and do clinics in Esperance, and then drive back home. So the reason I'm showing you this is because my whole incident happened while I was traveling back after my clinics 
from Esperance to Kalgoorlie. So Esperance down here, and this is a map. And if you've ever been to the outback of Australia, there are very small towns and hardly anyone that lives in those towns. So I'm talking about 25, sometimes 50 people, sometimes 100 people, sometimes just kangaroos, right? So that's the kind of terrain that I was driving on as I was heading back home. So I started my journey at about 9.30 in the morning. I had a, you know, a good breakfast as usual. We have, I work for the government, I'm a public servant, so they put me up in a hotel and there's a good cooked breakfast. Normally I have bacon and eggs, uh, but that day I chose to have cereal, so I don't recommend that anymore. Uh, I, I'm just kidding, but I did actually have cereal. And as I started my journey, don't let my hair fool you, by the way, I was only 39. I'm celebrating my 50th birthday on the 5th of April. So I was only 39 years old, um, you know, an associate professor of medicine, head of department, and I started to have discomfort in my chest. Now, let me ask the men sitting here, how many of you have had discomfort in your chest? Yeah, and what do we say? Gas, right? Yeah, that, that's what I said too. So that's what I thought I was having, some sort of indigestion. I, I was not used to having cereal, and I thought just with the journey, you know, that's what's going on. And it was only a discomfort in the chest. It was not actually chest pain. So I, I continued to drive, and this young lass who is here, her name is Zunaira. She's a Pakistani Muslim girl. She was my intern. I know that intern is almost a bad word in, in the U.S., um, thanks to Bill Clinton, but you know, we won't go there. Uh, uh, but a medical, <laughs> sorry about that, but Bill, <laughs> the, but Zanera is the first year out of medical school. That's who an intern is. So this was her first job as a doctor. And so she was in the car with me. She had never driven in Australia before. So I was driving the car and we were driving along, and I drove almost 350 kilometers. Um, and, you know, I still continue to have this discomfort in the chest. If you look at this map here, this place that you see down here is about halfway between Esperance and Kalgoorlie. It's a place called Norseman. So that's about 200 k's out. And so we stopped there um, and had a cup of coffee, and I still had this discomfort in my chest. It wasn't getting any worse, it wasn't any better. Got back into the car and began to drive, and I came to just about here before you actually have to go up to this town called Kambalda and then drive up to Kalgoorlie where we live. So right about here, I started to feel hot and sweaty. Now that's not unusual in the Kalgoorlie Boulder area because it was 36 degrees centigrade pretty hot, and so I thought it must be just the heat, but I was in a good Toyota Camry. So I asked the intern, um, Zanera, how do you feel in the car? Are you feeling hot? She said, no, it's, it's perfect. And then I started to have a bit of nausea, and I thought to myself, something is not right here. And so in the middle of nowhere, in outback Australia, there's not much you can do. So I pulled over to the side of the road, and that was the first time that I told her, look, I'm having a bit of discomfort in my chest. Can you imagine she just became white? She was so, you know, like she was shocked. So I asked her to actually check my pulse, which is probably the, about the only thing that you can do there. And it seemed to be fairly normal. So I got out of the car and decided to call my wife, Sherry. She's the doctor as well. And so I told her what was going on. So she asked me, Sean, do you feel that you'd be able to drive up to Kalgoorlie, which is, you know, another uh, 60 to 80 kilometers away? And I said, yeah, I think I can. I feel pretty good. Uh, I think I should be able to. She said, okay, I will contact the emergency physicians at the hospital. You come straight to the emergency, and I will meet you there. So that's the conversation that we had. I got into the car, and I actually began to drive on this road. This is about 20 kilometers long. As I was driving on that road, I really felt very strongly in my heart, I shouldn't be driving. I need to find a clinic in Kimbalda and get in there. And of course, I now know 
that was it was the spirit of god that was actually compelling me to do that and so i actually i'm trevor who is here with us he's from australia too he'll tell you he's here because i can't find my way anywhere uh, i'm terrible at directions and i'm i'm shamelessly admitting that but that day i managed to actually find the clinic and i decided to get into that clinic and when i say clinic i need you to understand um i don't know what you call it here but we call it a general practice clinic i think you call it family practice in in us is that right so it's tiny and just to show you here there's two doctors who normally practice in this clinic this is dr rao and this is dr chris chris was actually away in perth and dr rao had gone out to lunch perfect timing isn't it but i managed to find the clinic got in there I introduced myself I said I'm Dr George and they said oh you're Dr George because they all know me I'm the guy who treats all of their patients in the big town so they send their patients to me and I said look I need to have an ECG done I'm having a bit of chest discomfort uh, can we organize that so the nurse said yep no problem come in with me and we got it done but there was no doctor so they actually handed me the ECG <laughs> so you know don't do this at home uh but i am the guy who actually treats heart attacks i am the guy who deals with this every single day and so i'm not sure are there any doctors here great fantastic you for those who are not familiar with reading ecgs i'm i'm not going to teach you how to read an ecg today but just to tell you that if you look at these leads 2 3 and avf you will find that this particular segment here is elevated we call it an st elevation myocardial infarction what that means is i was having a heart attack in the inferior wall of the heart okay so i looked and said at this and said oh my god i'm having a heart attack and i said you know please call dr rao i'm having a heart attack ask him to come from his lunch and he was kind enough to come very quickly it's it's a you know a very small town um i think there's about 800 people who live in kambalda and so he came out pretty quickly and he said shawn look and i know him pretty well you know he refers patients to me and i said he said look shawn you're only 39 there's no way you're having a heart attack you know this is probably something from your esophagus let's move in to the next room and let's do another ecg i'll get you to lie down in the other room and by that time i actually started to have quite severe chest pain you know a really severe chest pain and i said rao um you know i i know that i'm having a heart attack let's let's get something happening and look this is a small gp clinic so they don't have most of the medications they have a few emergency things that are part of the uh, the college of general practice compels them to have a defib you know have a ecg monitor and a few things like that but they don't have medications they don't have the clot busting drug nothing available there so he takes me across to the next room and he asked me to lie down on that bed and they hooked me up to the uh, defibrillator and within 8 minutes before we could actually get the second ecg done so they had the first ecg and 8 minutes later after i had lay down in that bed i could see on that monitor my heart rate was going up my blood pressure was going up and i was like wait a minute i don't have any of these problems why is this happening i was in severe pain i was reacting to the pain and then basically within 8 minutes all of a sudden while i was lying down my heartbeat completely stopped i had a seizure and that was it i went into cardiac arrest now i'm not sure how many of you are medical that's different from having a heart attack you know heart attack is when the blood supply to a particular area of the heart has been compromised and stopped but a cardiac arrest is when your heart actually stops there's no pumping of the heart or no pumping of blood from the heart to any part of the body there's no breathing on your own either so that's what a cardiac arrest is and so immediately dr rao 
my intern and a couple of the nursing staff who were there, they began to do chest compressions or CPR. So by the time they could actually hook on the paddles uh, of the defib machine, they noticed that I was in a particular cardiac rhythm called ventricular fibrillation. How many of you have heard of ventricular fibrillation? Oh, good. There's so many. That's fantastic. Have you seen these machines in your malls? Do you have malls in Squim? Yeah, okay. So they're called automatic external defibrillators, AEDs. And that's to be used in this particular cardiac rhythm because rather than the heart contracting, it's just shivering like this. And the only way that you can actually get the heart to come back to pumping is to deliver an electrical shock. And what the electrical shock really does is it actually stops the heart and hopefully the pacemaker of the heart, which is in the sinoatrial node, will restart the heart with the normal rhythm. So that's the whole purpose of delivering a shock. Now I'm going to have to educate you a little bit about this because that's not the only way that you have a cardiac arrest. There are uh, different ways that you can have a cardiac arrest, but there are only two in which the electrical shocks are useful. One is ventricular fibrillation, and the second is called pulseless ventricular tachycardia. The other ways that you can have a cardiac arrest is when you have a flat line, what we call as asystole, or you could have meaningless electrical activity which we call pulseless electrical activity. Now, in those two conditions, shocking a patient has got no benefits at all. And the machine actually in an automatic defibrillator decides whether this is a shockable type of rhythm or not. Now, just to let you know, when someone's in ventricular fibrillation, there is no blood supply going anywhere. And that's why even before delivering the shocks, often, they do CPR to try and get some blood moving to the rest of the body. But once you shock the patient, you hope that the heart will stop and restart with a, a rhythm that can actually get the blood to the rest of the body. So that's the whole purpose of giving the shock. So I'm just going to say that before I, I continue with that, because there's so many women here, I'm sure you'd want to know what my wife was doing. Uh, so she actually got a phone call after my call to say that actually from me, because I had reached the Kambalda clinic and I called her and said, Sherry, I'm not coming home immediately. I'm actually having a heart attack. Uh, the ambulance will bring me home. And this is before I had the cardiac arrest. And the next phone call that she got was to say that your husband's actually gone into cardiac arrest. They're actually doing CPR on him. Um, he's in a really bad way. You need to get to Kambalda. And so she gets uh, into a car along with my medical registrar and the other consultant who works with me. And they were driving up from Kalgoorlie to Kimbalda while all of this is transpiring here. So as she was in the car, she was uh, driving along. This is what was happening in Kimbalda. So this is the actual log of the defibrillator, which is automatically recorded on the machine it was a Zoll M-series defibrillator. This is automatic. This is not something that I can manufacture. I've just taken pictures of this later on. And you'll see here that at 1344, the first shock was actually um, advised by the machine. So my cardiac arrest would have been somewhere here between you know, about 1343, because the shock was advised there. Now, just remember that when the machine actually asks you to give the shock, then the doctor has to actually press the button to deliver the shock. So that's what Dr. Rao did. And just so that you know that in between the shocks, you're supposed to continue the CPR, which is also what they did. Now, generally, if you read most of the medical lit literature, if you are in ventricular fibrillation and there's no blood going anywhere and there's no CPR being done, all it takes is four minutes of that and your brain begins to die, right? And this is the reason why they hope to get you out of the ventricular fibrillation as quickly as possible. 
So, you know, normally you'd give two or three shocks and hope that they would actually come out of the ventricular fibrillation. So here you can see the first shock was delivered at 1344, and then you can see the second shock, the third shock, the fourth shock, you can see the fifth shock, the sixth shock, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, thirteen shocks over a period of 48 minutes, right up to 1430. Now, what happened after this, if you can read there, I hope it's clear to you at the back, you can see at 1432 when the ne next cycle after the CPR was up, the DFib did not advise a shock. And the reason was because I then went into a flat line, what we call as asystole. You watch movies, what do they show you? A flat line. So that's the rhythm that I was in after being in ventricular fibrillation, clinically dead for 48 minutes already. So no more shocks were delivered. They were then just doing CPR um, on me. And I don't know, have any of you done CPR? You know how hard this is, right? Even for two minutes, doing CPR at 100 per minute. And you know, they use the song, Staying Alive. That's the kind of rate at which you should be doing it. 100 per minute, do that for two minutes. It's very exhausting. So here you can see they've already been doing it for 48 minutes. And then let me continue from where my wife was because she was driving in the car. And before that, the emergency physicians from Kalgoorlie Hospital were asked to actually come to Kambalda because they are trained in this area. And so they were asked to come out to Kambalda by the medical director at Kalgoorlie Hospital. And so they actually came out and they had reached a few minutes before my wife had. And by this time, the CPR had gone on for well over an hour. We're talking about 6,000 or more chest compressions. And still, I was dead. And so when the senior emergency physician, Dr. Steve Dungy, um, he's, he, at that stage, he was over 25 years experienced. He worked at a big tertiary hospital in Perth and he was doing a locum in Kalgoorlie. So when he had seen all that had happened, he had suggested to the team, look guys, we know Sean's our colleague, you've done the best that you can, you need to stop the CPR. It's just too long, we know that his brain's going to be dead, and so we need to stop the CPR. But there was a bit of a, uh, an argument between my intern, she was really distraught, and she said, look, Sean's wife is on the way, why don't we at least continue the CPR till she comes? So they kind of had a discussion, and it was decided that they'd do another two cycles of CPR, and at the end of those two cycles of CPR, if nothing happened, they would stop. That was the plan. So my wife finally reaches Kambalda, and on the way, the other physician in the car was actually giving instructions on the phone to the intern, saying, why don't you try this next? Why don't you try this? Because they are... She's just a junior doctor, and the other doctor is a general or family practitioner. So at the end of that, my wife actually reached there, and Dr. Dungy had done the two extra cycles of CPR. They had given the last shot of adrenaline that they had, and then they decided to call off the resuscitation. So they had actually stopped the chest compressions, and all they were doing is they had put a tube down my throat, which is called endotracheal intubation, and they were just giving a bit of oxygen, but they had completely stopped the compressions on my chest. So Dr. Dungy comes out to my wife, Sherry, and says, Sherry, I'm so sorry. Sean is gone. You can go in and say goodbye. So you can imagine, you know, the state that my wife was in. And while she was coming to Kimbalda, she actually had a call from her father and he said, look, I know you're a doctor. I know this looks really, really bad. But you go there and pray. God can do the impossible. So when she walked into that room, all the doctors, the nurses, everyone was standing back except the one who was actually giving me a bit of oxygen through the endotracheal tube. And she saw me. I was white. I know you don't believe that, but I was. Um, 
And the ECG monitor was actually a flat line. She held my hand. It was cold. And she just closed her eyes. And in that moment, she just prayed a very simple prayer. She said, Lord, Sean's 39. I'm 38. We have a 10-year-old boy. I need a miracle. And the moment she said that in her heart, beep, 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 my heartbeat came back. Now, you can imagine there was so much of confusion there because they can't send me to the morgue anymore. <laughs> you know, my heartbeat's back. They don't know what to do with me. And, and I talked to Dr. Dunji, and he said, Sean, I was thinking, oh my goodness, this is the worst thing to happen. Because here you have a person who's been dead now for one hour and 25 minutes. They had stopped the CPR for about 5 to 11 minutes. We're not really sure how long it was with us, 5 or 11 or in between that. I'm going to be brain dead. And so he was thinking, oh my goodness, this is so bad. Because you know what happens next? The wife and the family have to make the decision to switch off the ventilator. One, you know, this is the, this, so he was thinking to himself, oh my goodness, this is the worst thing. But he had to then continue to resuscitate me. So I was deeply unconscious, and they moved me from there to Kalgoorlie via the ambulance. This is just a timeline um, to show you what actually happened. Uh, I started from Esperance at about 9.30. Um, I reached the Kambalda Clinic at 13.25. The first ECG was done at 13.34. I went into cardiac arrest at 13.42. The first shock was delivered at 13.44. 13th and final shock at 14.30. The ED physician arrived at about 14.50. And the last shot of adrenaline and CPR at 14.52. And at 15.07, when my wife prayed, my heartbeat came back. ROSC stands for return of spontaneous circulation. That means I had a pulse and a heartbeat. So if you look at that, I was in ventricular fibrillation for 48 minutes, and the flat line, what we call asystole, for 37 minutes. A total of one hour and 25 minutes of being clinically dead. Oh, is that a wrong slide? No, it's not. I want to put this up because Trevor is here today. It was Trevor's wife who actually took this picture in their front yard because as I was being transported from Kimbalda back to Kalgoorlie on a 36 degree centigrade day, there was a massive hailstorm. And I'll tell you what, that was the first time I've ever heard of a hailstorm in Kalgoorlie. There's been many after, but what that meant was they could not shift me from the rural outback hospital that I work in to the major tertiary hospital. So they managed to get me to Kalgoorlie Hospital, and there the emergency physician, Dr. Steve Dungy, said, you know, he thought to himself, look, he's not going to make it. He's brain dead, but let me ask his wife whether I can give the clot-busting drug. Because normally, after such a long CPR, it's actually quite dangerous to give the clot-busting drug. You can actually cause hemorrhage, and, and if the person's not already dead, you know, you could kill the person. But my wife said, I believe in my heart God's done a miracle. You go ahead and do what you need to do. So they gave me the clot-busting drug. And finally, at about 8.30 in the night, through the Royal Flying Doctor Service, they managed to get me to the emergency department in Royal Perth Hospital. They took me to the cardiac cath lab, where they did an angiogram. All of you familiar with what that is? They put, they put um, a catheter up your femorals, and they can actually see the arteries supplying the heart. So when they did that, I actually had a block in my right coronary artery. And that's the artery that supplies the base of the heart or the inferior wall. So they opened up the block and put in a bit piece of plumbing. We call it stents. And so they put in a stent. And while they were doing this procedure, I had another two episodes of cardiac arrest. And that was also ventricular fibrillation. And they had to give me two more shocks. But each time they gave me a shock, my heartbeat came back. Now, I only found that out from the cardiologist later, that this had actually happened. And so finally, 
at about 1.30 in the morning on Friday, uh, Saturday the 25th of October, they finally got me to the ICU in Perth. Now, just remember, I'm still deeply unconscious. Now I'm on a mechanical ventilator. They have tried to cool down my body. We call it therapeutic hypothermia. They've given me nitric oxide to try and preserve if there's any brain function at all. The registrar comes to my wife and tells her, look, I'm really sorry. I know that his heart is there, but he's brain dead. It's going to be a matter of minutes to hours, and Sean will be gone. And she looked at him, and she's a doctor too, and she said, look, I believe God has done a miracle. My husband's going to walk out of here. And he got angry. And I, look, I'm a doctor. I shouldn't be saying this, but that's the truth. He actually got angry. And he said, you're a doctor. You should know better than that. And he just walked away disgusted, thinking that this was going to be an easy conversation. But I actually survived through that Saturday. I was on two different drugs to support my blood pressure. And in fact, my blood pressure was still really low. The pH of my blood, which, which is really crucial for our cell functioning, was 6.9. The normal pH of blood is between 7.35 to 7.45, and it was 6.9, and I still survived through that Saturday. And on the Sunday, this is what I looked like. One of my very close friends had come to visit. His wife just could not bear to see me in the state, so he took a picture for her, and that's how I actually have this picture. You can see, you don't need to be a doctor to know how bad this actually looks. Look at the number of pumps that I had. My kidneys, which were normal before, had failed. My liver had failed. And they were expecting that my heart would stop at any time. The breathing was being done by the, the mechanical ventilator. So this was the Sunday, the 26th of October, 2008. And my wife gets a phone call from her aunt who lives in South India. And her aunt said, look, there's been a lady who has been praying for Sean, and God has revealed to her that tonight before you go to bed, Sean's going to open his eyes. Now, again, look at this picture. If I'm not already brain dead, I'm on all the drugs to keep my brain dead, you know, with midazolam, morphine, so that you don't fight against the ventilator. So that night, one of my colleagues who is a pediatri pediatrician, her name is Dr. Christine Jeffrey Stokes, she came to visit me. And while she was at my bedside, you know how people try to talk to people who are unconscious? So she was holding my hand, and she said, Sean, if you can hear me, you know, squeeze my hand. And I actually squeezed her hand in this deeply comatose state. And so she actually sort of got startled and... She said, Sean, open your eyes. And for a very brief few seconds, I opened my eyes. My wife was there. Dr. Christine was there. They immediately called the nurse. They called for the registrar. He refused to come. He said, you are imagining this is impossible. But you know what? They had to change their mind because on Monday, I began to actually slowly move my limbs. By Wednesday... They were able to actually remove the tube from my throat. I was breathing on my own. I woke up. I looked around, and I said, oh, what am I doing here? Can I have a look at my ECG and my ABG? My brain, my friends, my brain was 100% normal. This is just a blood test to show that I had a massive heart attack. This is called a troponin test. This is the blood test that we do to see whether you've had a heart attack. This is the liver function test. I had a normal liver, uh, and that had failed, and then it started to come good on its own. I had kidney failure. I actually had to have dialysis six times before my kidneys started to come good. All of this is evidence that there was multi-organ damage. But the brain, which should have been damaged first, because the brain cannot be starved of oxygen. The brain has no metabolism without oxygen. 
my brain was 100% normal. And friends, I was actually discharged on the 13th day, and people came looking for me, and that's when they began to say, Miracle Man has left the hospital, because nobody could believe it. So I just want to introduce to you, um, that's my wife and son, my mom, who is no more, and this is Sherry's mom, and this is Trevor's wife, Julie, and this is my medical registrar's wife, Aggie. Um, this is Sherry's dad, who asked her to pray for me. And so finally, I was discharged from the hospital, and they actually published this in the West Australian newspaper because they had never seen anything like this. And that's my heart doctor, um, Dr. Shetty, uh, who was standing in the, in, in the back. And so that's my story. Thank you. Wow. Um, so that was, that was pretty intense, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> it's, it's an extraordinary story, Sean. Um, now, before I ask some questions of my own, let me repeat. If you look up on your uh, order paper, you'll see that there is a number. If you want to text in a question, uh, we've got 25 minutes or so for, for, for some questions. Feel free to do that and I will be passed a sheet of paper or a phone or something, and I can read some of them off. But I've got plenty of my own questions to get us started, right. um, Sean. Uh, in a sense, it, it feels like one of, one of the most extraordinary things about this story, quite apart from the, the, the nature of what happened, is that you are a doctor who is completely familiar, in fact, a leader in your field when it comes to these phenomena. Um, many people, if they claim to have had a miracle experience, they're often not in a position to really interpret the data, the medical, often not even in a position to get hold of the data in the first place. So in a way, your story is made all the more powerful by the fact that you, you actually were able to, to, to have the data and to understand it, obviously, from a medical position. So was that significant for you, that, that this was obviously part of that wider story? So you can imagine my shock when I came back. And to put the pieces of the puzzle together and to find out what actually happened, because I remembered, as I woke up, I remembered everything to the point that I could see the cardiac monitor, remember me, you know, that my pulse rate was going up, my blood pressure, and then, for the next 110 hours, I had lost everything. And then, to piece what had actually happened after that, um, I was in absolute shock. How can this happen? This, this confronted me as a doctor, as well. And so I took it upon myself to do a deep discovery on what actually happened. I went back to the Kimbalda Clinic. There were people clapping, and you, know, you can imagine. But I tried to piece together what actually happened. And yes, you're right. I, I, I'm in a unique position because this is my field of practice. And I, I'm a person who actually teaches advanced life support. I teach this stuff. And I know that normally, you know, CPR is done for 20 to 30 minutes. And I know that the reason why we actually stop is if it's um, not going to bear any fruits and if the you know, patient is not going to come back, we know that the brain is dying and it's often irreversibly dead by that time. So it was a huge discovery. It confronted me on many levels. Even though I was a Christian man, when the rubber hits the road, <laughs> It's different, you know, being a doctor and having it happen to you, it's, it's very different. So I saw a different part of the journey that the patients actually go through, and I, I was able to appreciate and therefore communicate what actually happened to me with the evidence. What, what about your medical colleagues? What did they make of it? Did they, were they willing to use the term miracle for what had happened yeah, to so you? Yeah, so I actually have, I, and hopefully I'll get to show you some slides later of, uh, some of the people that were involved in the resuscitation and also others who looked after me in Royal Perth Hospital because this was you know, amazing to them that this had never happened in their life history as well. So right in that clinic, there were actually three Hindu doctors and there were three Christian doctors as well. And Dr. Rao, he's a Hindu and he's still a Hindu, and he tells me, Sean, you know, I've never seen anything like this. He was actually given an award uh, for the resuscitation 
Dr. Steve Dungy, who actually is a Christian, um, and he said to me that in his 35 years, that now he's 35 years of experience, he has never seen anything like this. He expected me to be brain dead and not ever wake up again. And so he, you know, he's very happy, and he's actually presented this at conferences internationally, and everywhere he has presented it, people have just like, what in the world is this? Mm. How can this happen? It confronts doctors a lot. I have presented it myself in many medical forums, journal clubs, uh, grand rounds. And to be truthful, there's no one who can say that this is not a miracle. The issue is what they do with the miracle. Mm. You know, so I've had responses of, wow, I mean, this is amazing. Uh, but it hasn't changed practice because mm -hmm. we know that this doesn't happen. We've already done all the research. We've got tons of evidence that, you know, this is just not possible. So it doesn't change practice. It hasn't changed my practice either. But what it does is it actually gives you a glimpse into the power of an almighty God who is able to do way beyond what we can imagine or think. I mean, this story is amazing. And, you know, we're all encouraged, you know, even if you're not a believer, we're People are happy, obviously, that, that you came through. Oh, that, that so everything, am I. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not least yourself. Um, but of course, it does raise that other important question of why you? Why not other people who perhaps have died from a heart attack for whom prayers were prayed, but there was no, no miracle answer? What, what do you do with that kind of an issue? Yeah, so look, I honestly believe I don't know the answer to why it was me. I can tell you quite honestly, um, I'm no one special. I can tell you that my wife's no one special. In fact, let me give you a bit of insight into the brain of my wife. Um, being a Christian and a doctor has its good parts and it's got its bad parts too. She will tell you any day of the week that when she prayed that prayer, her faith was really tiny. While she was being driven to the clinic in Kimbalda, um, she was actually coming to pick up a dead body. Mm. That's what she told her dad. Dad, I'm going to pick up a dead body. And he encouraged her and said, look, I know you're a doctor, but you're also a Christian. You know God can do miracles. You just go there and pray. So I can be quite honest. I don't know why God answered. I'm sure happy that he did. <laughs> and it also told me that I've married the right woman. <laughs> uh, but God always answers prayers. But he may not necessarily answer the prayer that we expect him, the way that mm -hmm. we expect. He always answers. And I can't even begin to fathom the mind of an almighty God as to why he does what he does when he does it. But I do know that I'm here. My family is happy that I'm here. And I believe God's got a plan with my life. And, and my guess is that through events like this and the many other places you've taken your story, it has been a pathway for others to start to investigate and understand and even potentially have faith in God. Yeah, I, I believe that, you know, it gives you at least a possible thought into the, the fact that there might be a God out there who actually cares for people and he, who does actually intervene in the lives of people. And I believe that sometimes God just gives you a signpost uh, that you can put your trust and anchor in. Um, and I believe, look, I'm not going to be the person who is going to bring everybody to faith in God, uh, but I do believe that I have a story that God's given me, and I should communicate that story in the best way that I can, because I can understand it. Well, I've got some really interesting questions here for yeah. you from, from uh, the audience that have been texted in. Um, here's an interesting one. Did you have an out-of-body experience at any point in this? So there's actually a short answer and a long answer. Let, <laughs> let me start with the short answer. And the short answer is, I honestly don't remember that I have. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember, 10 years now it's been, and I can't actually remember if I saw anything. As I said, I could remember everything up to the point that I actually arrested, mm -hmm. and then nothing for 110 hours, and then I, I got everything back mm -hmm. again. But the long answer is, you know, there was a lady who was praying for me that I had mentioned in my talk. Let me give you a bit of a background. This lady is an uneducated lady who lives in South India, she used to be a Muslim, and she came to know Christ, and she's a woman of prayer. She's not educated. She's not a preacher. 
She's never left the country at that stage. But while she was praying for me, God revealed a number of things to her. Not just that I would wake up at this, on that night, as I did. She also told me that I would be doing things like this. I mean, if you see the village she comes from, it's not things that she could drum up or imagine. She said I would be on the TV, I'd be in programs, I'd be writing, I'd be written about. All of those things have happened. The third thing she said is that God has shown you many things which he has actually hidden from your eyes. And I, I can tell you that I haven't gone pursuing it because I'm a bit freaked out, honestly. What did I see? You know, my Irish friends asked me, so did you see flames? Uh, you know, um, but I haven't pursued that matter with God. I believe that if God really wants to show me, he will. Okay. But at this stage, I can honestly tell you, I don't remember seeing a light. I don't remember floating above my body or anything of that sort. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's quite a few questions about the, the specifics of this and, and possible alternative explanations and so on. And perhaps you can explain some of the, the, the particular issues that are being brought up here. But one person asks, um, what about the Lazarus effect and auto-resuscitation? Could you explain what those are and, um, sure. um, and whether they are, are any kind of an explanation of what happened yeah, to you? Yeah, so um, in fact, that's a very interesting phenomenon that was first described in 1982. The Lazarus effect. The Lazarus phenomenon. And it was actually um, published in 1983 by Dr. Bray and he he, they then called it the Lazarus phenomenon because it was like the resurrection of Lazarus. In the Bible, yeah. In the Bible. So what they actually found is that when you do CPR, and particularly when you uh, deliver oxygen or breaths, if you give too many breaths, you can actually stack up the breaths. We call it uh, auto-peep or positive end expiratory pressure. And so what actually happens is there's a dynamic, I'm sorry to use the words, but it's hard to make it uh, very simple, but you actually begin to inflate the chest sequentially, mm -hmm. and there's just not enough time for decompression of the chest. Is that sort of clear? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what that does is that it prevents the venous return into the heart and therefore prevents the heart from actually contracting. Okay. So it's mainly when you give too much of... Um, uh, breaths. Mm -hmm. So that's why we actually recommend doing six to maximum of 10 breaths per minute and not more than that because you can create this dynamic hyperinflation. So what they found was that there were people who were dying and then five minutes later without doing anything at all their heart would come back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I've actually looked into all the cases published of it and I have uh, all the slides up there but I'll try and quickly tell you there were 49 published cases of Lazarus phenomenon. And what actually happened is they realized that this is how we now uh, declare someone to be dead, is we don't actually declare soon after they're dead. We wait for about five minutes, and in some countries even longer, up to 10 minutes, before you declare someone to be dead, because they can have this dynamic hyperinflation. And so when they stop giving the breaths, that dynamic hyperinflation goes off, and blood can return to the heart, and it starts up again. But even the outcome of Lazarus phenomenon is absolutely horrendous. Most of the patients who have even come back, most of them die. In fact, the study which I quoted, which is the 49, which is the latest mm -hmm. one that was released, only 11 of the 49 actually survived. And most of them had a very short duration of CPR. Right. Right. In my case, what sets this apart is, first of all, they did not actually stop the oxygen at all. Mm -hmm. They actually, that was the only thing that they continued was to give the oxygen. The only thing they stopped was the chest compression. Now that can help, but they hadn't stopped the actual oxygen delivery. The second thing is my CPR had gone on for such a long time, and then they had completely stopped it. And then my wife prayed and the heartbeat come back. But even with Lazarus phenomenon, the positive neurological outcomes of that has been very, very minimal. And as I said, most of them is a very short duration of CPR. Okay. Um, uh, is that clear? I, I think yeah. 
I mean, we, we'll, we'll have more opportunity uh, after the break for um, both our Christian and atheist um, philosopher to, to, to quiz you on some of these issues as well. Yeah. But another person asks, um, what do you think is possibly the most plausible alternative explanation for your survival? Do you have one? And if there is one, why, why don't you think it actually works? Yeah, so I have actually asked many colleagues um, and friends and uh, people whom I respect and you know, people who are very big in the field, I've not been able to actually get any real plausible explanation at all. Um, and the best explanation that I have ever been given is that you know, you're a statistical anomaly. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I, I don't want to think of myself as a number. I'm a person <laughs> like you guys. I have a family, I have a kid. You know, and, and that's the best explanation I've ever had. So to be quite honest with you, when I actually explain and I have an opportunity to show you my slides, um, I still can't find an explanation for why I should be here. Thank you. I've got some more questions coming through. I mean, one of the questions was along those lines, asking how do you know that your experience isn't an outlier? Well, in a sense, you, you know it is an outlier. It is an unusual case. Um, and ask, are there other similar accounts? Um, have you ever come across anything else that, resembles what you went through. Yeah, so I have obviously, like many of you, heard about different people who have come back to life. Often the problem is that we can't see the scientific evidence or the documentary evidence of it. Now, there are cases of prolonged resuscitation, which I'll be showing later. Um, and in my research over the last 28 years, there are nine uh, patients who have had prolonged CPR who have come back to life with neurological functions being intact, but none of them had stoppage of CPR for this period of time. So that's where my story is actually different from others. Uh, but there are cases, and as I said, in the last 28 years that I have searched, there's about nine patients who have come back to life after 60 minutes of CPR. Um, and again, you know, this is a very complex area because you have to try and compare apples with apples, and so there are things that we do now, like what's called as extracorporeal membrane oxygenator, which is basically doing the function of a heart and a lung. So you can actually keep the heart and the lung going as you would with a normal heart and lung. Mm. So that has, you know, in some ways improved the outcome of resuscitation as well. But as I said, in my investigation, right up to 2018, there are 20, you know, almost um, nine patients who have similar, but none of them had stoppage of CPR for the time that I had. One of them had stoppage of CPR for like a minute when they changed from uh, manual compression to a machine that does compression. There's a couple of questions that are of a similar nature here. Um, one of them asks, um, couldn't this just be a rare instance aided by modern technology that's yet undiscovered by science? And, and another asks, how do you actually tell the difference between a supernatural miracle and something that's simply an extraordinary natural cause that you just don't yet understand? So in, in a sense, the question is, why do you attribute this to God and not some unexplained natural phenomena that we simply aren't aware of at this point? Yeah, so there's a few reasons that I think that this is a miracle. One, we've done a lot of research into resuscitation. And to be quite honest, if all the research is wrong, then you know, we're in big trouble because, because often than not, resuscitation is actually stopped within 17 minutes on average, in, from what I understand um, from lots of the papers that I've read. In Europe, it's actually about 20 minutes. And so if all the research that we've done so far is wrong, uh, then we should really be resuscitating people for a lot longer. And you don't actually see that happening at all because we have got all the research out there there's, you know, I wouldn't say we don't know about this or we don't know about that. I think what's very interesting, though, is to understand that um, you may say that you may find an explanation for this 100 years from now. The truth is I don't live 100 years from now. I live right now. And I'm a real doctor. I need to make decisions for my patients today based on the evidence and knowledge that I have. And, and I'll tell you, Nothing has changed. I actually teach this every year. And so if anything changed in that area, I would be the first to know. Mm. And so we haven't changed any of that. Look, 
uh, the one thing that I did have positive for me is that I was young. Um, and you know, I don't mean that in any bad way. Um, but that's always a good thing, because your body has the chance of doing something. Um, and to be quite honest, mine was one of the worst case scenarios, because I was in the outback of country Australia, in a small clinic, doctor out to lunch. I mean, how much worse can it get? You have to read your own ECG. And then, to get to Perth, there was a significant delay. And um, so the circumstances of my situation was actually quite bleak. The other interesting thing here is the fact that they had stopped the CPR mm. for such a prolonged period of time. So now you need to understand, even when you do chest compression, you're not actually able to send the blood to the rest of the body in the same way that the heart does. Mm. So it's a low blood flow state to start with. And that's the reason why they don't do prolonged CPR, because your blood starts to get sticky. Mm -hmm. uh, there's aggregation of the platelets. And then there's actually a lot of substances that are released because of the lack of oxygen, like ac lactic acid, carbon dioxide, free radicals, etc. Now, as I mentioned before, the brain requires oxygen for everything. It does not have any anaerobic metabolism. That means it cannot function without oxygen. So how can I explain either today or tomorrow or 100 years from now how after one hour and 25 minutes and then stoppage of CPR, when my wife prayed, you see, there's a, there's a religious historic context there. Yes, this wasn't just out of the blue you came back. It was at a very specific point when it, that prayer was prayed. She, in fact, when she opened her eyes, there was so much of a commotion around her. They were moving her back, and she heard the beep on the monitor. And all of a sudden, there was a pulse. So look, all I can say is when you put the evidence together, when I have done the research to see, are there anybody else in this world like me? I haven't actually found anyone who has died, had CPR, stopped CPR after such a long time, and come back to life with a normal brain. Mm. Now, there are people who have had long CPR and come back with a normal brain. And that's, as I said, in the last 28 years, there's about nine of them. Mm. I haven't talked to any of them, so I don't know whether that was a miracle. Who knows? You know, I don't know. But as I said, I live in this time frame. We are in 2019. And I do know that we all are going to die. I also know that I have got a lifespan. And when God decides, I will die. The question is, what decision am I going to make while I'm alive? I have one opportunity in life to make a decision to either believe in God or not to believe. What somebody does 100 years from now is not going to matter to me. I'm going to be dead and gone. The question really today is, are you going to make a decision for God now? And all I can say is, based on the best evidence that I have, I can't explain what happened to me in any other way than the fact that a supernatural intervention from God happened. Because no one wakes up asking for their ECG <laughs> and their ABG. I was back to being a physician. Mm. And I'm still a physician. Look, it's been great to have some questions from the audience. We are going to get more grilling for you, I'm afraid, after the coffee break. Uh, we're going to have a really interesting uh, little uh, conversation here with uh, a Christian and atheist philosopher about miracle claims generally, and then we're going to get you back up to, to, to do some cross-examination, Sean. But for the moment, can you give a, a round of applause for Sean?